I was struck this week as uh, I was watching a program. And the program um, is, um, turns out very unexpectedly to be more than just a police show. It uh, turns out to be what I call, reminded me of the power of love and fried chicken. Okay? The power of love and fried chicken. Uh, what the story was about was this police officer who has a reputation for being a quick draw, somebody who's fast to shoot, okay, and will take very decisive and often lethal action, uh, is put into an interesting situation because he's in his office and uh, they're bringing a convict and moving him from a medium security facility to a high security facility. And so along that process, this convict manages to get the upper hand on the two uh, police officers who are bringing him from one facility to the other. And so the expectation is that our hero will immediately pull out his gun and kill this guy. And in fact, those are his instructions. Well, instead of doing that, um, he turns out to be fast thinking. He realizes that even though he has a 50-50 chance of getting the guy, that could still mean that the person he's got in his grasp might be killed in the process. And if he didn't get him, then the other guy might be killed also. And so, you know, while he might come out as the winner by killing the convict, those other police officers will come out as losers. And so he doesn't uh, jump in and uh, start to shoot, but he starts to talk to the guy. And the first thing he does is he starts to talk to him honestly and frankly and forthrightly, okay? The guy says, no BS, and he replies, no, I'll tell you like it is. And so he's very honest with him. And so as they're starting to talk and they're going through this process, he starts to find out why this guy is so angry and determined not to go to the next prison. Because the guy tells him about how um, the guards at his current facility have been very abusive and in a whole number of ways, describe little ways of just making your life miserable. And the idea is, you know, we were miserable enough, we were in enough fear and pain, and yet these people were just adding to it. And so uh, uh, one of the things he talked about was how they messed around with their food, how they would take all their food and throw it together into a blender, mix it all together, and it would be one goop kind of a thing. Then they take and they freeze it and then give it to you to eat like an ice cream bar, okay? And so the guards are having fun with the prisoners in this way. And uh, he says, what I did was I would not let them get to me. I would overcome them and I would pretend while I'm eating this sad thing that it was the best thing I'd ever eaten. I pretend that it was like the spicy fried chicken that I used to love from this one particular place and I'd lick my lips and I'd try to drool and I'd do all this stuff and I would show them. And so the deputy says, oh, you like fried chicken? I like fried chicken too. And uh, so they start to talk about fried chicken and ultimately he sends one of the other guards to go out and bring him some fried chicken. Okay, but the whole process is that instead of taking out a gun and shooting him, he's listening with alertness and attentiveness and with empathy. You know, he found out that this guy had a reason to be angry on the way over from the facility to this holding place the two escorting guards had also been abusing this guy even along the way, kind of like getting in their last licks. And so that's why 
it became personal with these two guys too. And so he didn't mind going out in a blaze of gunfire and uh, dying. So he understood how this guy was feeling. And he started to talk to him with that understanding. And basically the bottom line is he treated this guy with some basic human dignity. And so as he talked, you know, and uh, they have all these honest exchanges, you know, they start to uh, show him, you know, becoming more natural, more at ease, though still alert. And then finally, by the end, after he's had the food, the fried chicken coming in, and just in the nick of time, you know, he's very mellowed, and eventually he gives up. No, while this is going on, in contrast, the SWAT team had been called in, okay? Because they would be the real shooters. These were the pros that had been trained for this. This guy just happened, our hero just happened to be a really good and fast shot, but it wasn't really his duty to do that if they could bring in a SWAT team. So the SWAT team comes in and they're raring to go. They got their procedure, boom, 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 and they want to execute as quickly as possible. Get the job done, solve the problem. And so, you know, in the end, the guy gives up and the problem is solved with no bloodshed at all and certainly without the loss of life of the other two guards. And I was just struck and reminded of a common failing that we go through in life, that I certainly do. Sometimes when we're faced with a situation and it's kind of critical and it's kind of difficult, what's our reaction? Deal with the problem. See it as a problem mainly. And in the process, you forget the people in the situation. And so you forget the human factor and you forget to deal with it as a human problem, a relational problem. And you're just trying to solve the issue. Think about it, right? Guys, when your wife comes to you and she starts to tell you about a problem that she's got, in her life with someone, what do we want to do, guys, naturally? <laughs> we want to give them an answer, right? We want to go out there and solve the problem. And many a time, the wife has had to grab you by the shoulder and shake you until you shut up and says, I just want you to do what? Listen. I don't need you to solve your problem. It's not about you and how capable you are. See, and it's kind of a problem because guys, we're wired to solve problems, right? We're not wired to listen. So we gotta adjust. We gotta make some very severe adjustments to get a hold of ourselves. But if we will listen, they go and they find a better answer. And so, Instead of looking at it as a critical issue and a problem, we deal with the people. And the person says, just listen to me and understand and appreciate what I'm going through. In other words, hold my hand, you know, and we'll get past this. Just give me five minutes, give me 10 minutes. So, so the tendency, and I find it happening all the time, sometimes, I get treated badly by a service person, a cashier, a bank teller, um, parking lot attendant or something like that. And I want to just let it rip, right? Tell them what's off. Go and say, I'm going to report you to your supervisor or your boss. You know, I'm going to go and Yelp and give a six-page review, you know, and run down your restaurant, whatever. But you know, sometimes if we just pause, and find out what's going on in that person's life. And we discover it's not about that. In fact, um, I remember a long time ago hearing about this Dallas Theological Seminary, one of the top seminaries. No, no, it wasn't Dallas. It was one of the Southern Baptist seminaries. And a professor was lecturing. And um, he would notice one particular student was always 
falling asleep on his lecture. Well, you know, first he's a little perturbed. Then the irritation grows, and it grows and grows. And finally, one day, he calls him out in the middle of class, and he dresses him up and down and tells him off. Okay? You don't want to be in this class? Don't come to the class. Um, afterwards, a fellow student came to him and said to him, Prof, I wish you hadn't said that because I know what's going on in this guy's life. Uh, he's been uh, working to uh, pay for his uh, seminary tuition. His wife is very sick, and so he has had to watch the kids. And, you know, and he went on to describe all the ordeal that he was going through and the lack of rest that was going on in his life. Well, again, the professor was looking at a problem of getting his lecture across to the student. And while his intention was good, he forgot the human factor, and he forgot to deal with that. Well, so it happens all the time. Uh, give you all these bad examples. Let me give you a good example. I was at a retreat one time, and um, it was not even on the day of testimonies, but one of the moms came to me, and she talked about what had gone on with her teenage daughter. Um, she had hit those teen years, and she started to become contrary. She started seemingly to be more lazy. She started to sleep until who knows when. And then she started getting messier and messier. Open the door, and you couldn't see any carpet because of all the clothes, all the books, all the junk. And so they started having these fights. And these fights got worse and worse until they couldn't stand to be in one another's presence. And the mom says, you know, one day she was praying desperately to the Lord, asking, what can I do? She was praying for her daughter. And she heard the Lord say to her, why don't you try loving her? And she says, I do love her. And the Lord says, love her some more. And then she says, well, what do I do? So she started to think about it. And of course, the first thing that happened was she started changing the relationship dynamic. And I can tell you this worked because I've coached other parents how to talk to their kids. You know, sometimes parents have a way of talking to their kids so that they feel like they're this big or, or worse, okay? Or they feel like they're trapped and they have nowhere to go, you know, or they're never trusted and that sort of a thing. And so it grates them to want to talk to their parents. So she started to learn how to talk to her daughter. And she says, by the time that she had, she was at the retreat, this was a process that had been going on for about a year. And it had gotten to a point where they were best friends. And, you know, uh, they could uh, work together. And it was just so simple, her learning to start to talk to her daughter, not like her little daughter, but like somebody at the office with a little dignity, a little respect, a little trust, and uh, allow them to express themselves too. And so uh, it just changed the whole thing around. So I remember from this TV show how I often tend to do that. Being a guy, I want to solve the problem, and I want to be the one who provided the answer instead of being the one to focus on the problem in order to properly deal with it. Well, that kind of also told me another thing. Until I get past that point, you know, maybe love is not such a high value in my life. I may have lots of different values that I care about in my life, but maybe love isn't at the place where the Bible says it should be. The Bible says love should be the greatest thing, that it's a fulfillment of all the law, right? And then it says that love is the essential thing. It's the way that we know that we are truly saved, that God is working in our lives and continuing to change us. And then love is not just a technique that we use to solve problems, 
but it's something that flows out of our character. And so maybe when I continue to look at situations and focus on the problem and focus on trying to you know, solve it, I haven't made that transition fully and steadily enough where you know, love is the paramount thing. When I was thinking about this, I realized, you know, same thing in churches. In a lot of churches, there's a lot of good things that go on. But shouldn't that be the primary thing in a church? Love? I've never seen that being the measure of success of the church, right? How many buildings? The size of the congregation? How big is the budget? I've looked at a lot of resumes and I've helped to write a lot of job descriptions for pastors and church staff. And it occurred to me, I've never seen must be loving on there anywhere. Now I thought about it, I said, well, you could take it for granted. But on the other hand, because we've taken it for granted, maybe all those other things, the size of the congregation, the amount of money, the number of buildings, the number of programs, those things have taken over and become the measure of success in churches. So anyway, as I was thinking about it, I remembered a book that I read once. It was called The Power of Loving Your Church. And this pastor's acknowledging the need for pastors to what? Be loving. Again, it goes without saying, but here's a book that says, well, maybe not. And I was curious about it because I couldn't find my copy. I went to Amazon and I read a few of the reviews. And uh, here is the review of a Korean pastor that he wrote on Amazon. <clears throat> he says, I had read this book in South Korea seven years ago. As I ministered, I have more and more realized the value of this book. I started to plant a Korean-speaking church in North Carolina, and this book has helped me know who is pastor. I'd like to recommend local church pastors who read this repeatedly beyond church growth book since pastors of local church are in front of souls who are herded, drained, and prisoned. I don't know what that last word is. Maybe imprisoned. But you know, he's talking about the congregations that people minister to. And maybe they need more love. So he closes his review <clears throat> with a one sentence paragraph. This book works good on ministry. So this is a, a book that he says he's read five times. So you know, in our lives, in our church life, in our homes, in our workplaces, wherever we congregate, wherever we have opportunity. And so those were some of the thoughts that were going in my mind. And I came up with this title, How to Love Like God. Did you guys look at that title? Did you notice that title? I wonder what went through your mind. I wonder if you thought, oh, theologically, is that possible? Some of you might have been, oh, okay, it's another sermon. Some of you might have been curious. I wonder if he's going to tell any jokes in this message. Uh, you know, this sermon could be easily dismissed by saying, there's no way I can love like God loves. But because I say how to do it, obviously it is something we're expected to do and it is something that we can do on a practical basis. So as we get into the message, I want us to each ask ourselves, is love such a core value in our lives, such a North Star that it's always in the forefront so that we see people as people rather than to see the situation or the problem and forget that there are real people in the midst of that? Um, let me ask you, 
a question. What's the classic Bible passage or verse about love in the Bible? Yeah, John 3, 16, right? Let me read to you not only 16, but the verse that follows it. It says, For God so loved the world that he gave his only Son, that whoever believes in him should not perish but have eternal life. For God did not send his Son into the world to condemn the world, but in order that the world might be saved through him. And I'd like to take those two verses in reverse. Verse 17 lays out the attitude that, which, that provides the beginning. God sees sinners, and what's his response? His attitude is no condemnation. And then in verse 16, we have the action that follows. And this is the highest form of love. And we'll talk about it in a little more detail after we go to our next passage. And I want you to turn to another John 3.16. What's the other John 3.16? No, close, a different one. First John 3.16. Okay? So turn with me to First John 3.16 and 17 are already up there. Okay. Um, here's what it says by this we know love and listen to these next words that he laid down his life for us and what are we supposed to do we ought to lay down our lives for the brothers and verse 17 but if anyone has the world's goods and sees his brother in need yet closes his heart against him how does God's love abide in him? Now, verse 17, once again, provides us with the attitude. All right? That as God has worked in our hearts, they're already open. Don't close your heart. When you see, when you know, when you're very clear, is the meaning of the Greek, that somebody needs help. Don't close your heart. And then verse 16 sounds just like John 3 16 to lay down yourself. Lay down yourself by loving. And the word for loving here is that Greek word that you probably heard of, agape. And I'd like to say that God loves at every level and in every way. But here, the greater includes the lesser. Okay, and all the commands to love in the New Testament is this word, agape. Okay? Um, so God calls us to love with the same wording, the same meaning. We are to lay ourselves down. Well, why are we to lay ourselves down? It says in verse 16, because Christ already laid himself down for us. So because we have benefited, we are to pass it on. The tricky part is how do we do it? What is the life that we're supposed to lay down? Um, the word for life here is not bios, it is not soma, it is the word suke. What English word does this remind you of? <laughs> the one I'm hoping you were saying is psyche. Right? Psyche. Which the synonym of psyche is self or ego. We are to lay down our ego. Now, I don't know about you, but I was born an egomaniac. When I was a baby, I wanted all of my 
parents' attention. I wanted 110% of their care, and when I was unhappy, I let them know by doing what? Crying. And as I got older, I learned how to throw tantrums. We're full of ego to start with. Well, growing up is a process of laying down our ego. To lay down our ego in a whole variety of ways. Being Chinese, being analytical, I have to learn to lay down my logic and my reasoning sometimes. Okay? Long ago, a lady shared with me a pain that she carried in her life. She was a licensed psychologist and therapist, and she was the supervisor of that department and program in her city. And she talked about how she was still hurting because when her mother remarried, her stepfather, through all the years, always insisted on going out to eat Chinese. And his logic was impeccable. Cheaper and better tasting. Agree? Well, I fear you won't. Anyway, but you know, the kids could never refute that. And she says, just once I would have liked to have gone to McDonald's. Well, you know, McDonald's and Chinese, no comparison. But I always remembered that. So last Sunday, we had the care of my older granddaughter. And it came around dinner time. Of course, you know where she wants to go. McDonald's, right? The land of Happy Meals. Now, out of every fast food chain, that would be probably at the bottom of my list. I've searched in vain for something I would like from McDonald's. And coffee, so far, is the only thing I like from McDonald's. Uh, and especially the senior citizen coffee. OK. Uh, but you know, she wants to go to McDonald's. We go to McDonald's. My reasoning, my logic, sometimes we lay down our ego by our time. Our time is the most precious thing, right? You cannot cultivate, you cannot multiply, you cannot buy more time. We use that expression, I want to buy me some time. I don't know what store sells more time, okay? But sometimes when you want to help somebody, you want to solve a problem for someone, you want to be involved in carrying their load and showing love, you've got to give up time. Sometimes it's laying down our agenda, our priority. You come home, first thing you want to do is go take a shower and clean up. But you know what? The kids want you. And you're going to have to be grungy for another hour or maybe until the evening is done. And then you can take care of your priorities and your agenda. Sometimes it's giving up our pride. Sometimes just giving up our place, our preference, our choices. Some of you, I notice, are real good at being last in line in the buffets. And you're saying to everybody, you go first. You know? And it's a simple expression. But see, when you break it down this way, when you think of life as ego and self, it's more than just possessions. And it's something you can all be giving and doing. Remember back in the old days, guys, when we would get up, give up our seat on a bus for the ladies, for the kids? Doesn't happen anymore. It becomes a big deal. But guess what? You have shown love, you know? Um, so it's something that is not impossible at all. This is agape, the lay down of 
our suke, our psyche. And God commands it, but you know, we said in past sermons, first, the love has been provided for us. He opened our hearts and he poured this love, Romans 5, 5, into our hearts so that we have the love to share. Number two, he's given us a powerful helper and partner, the Holy Spirit. Any of you still driving a car with no power steering? How about power brakes? I remember one time my wife's father bought one of the first Japanese cars, and it was a small car. And so they decided no power steering. And I remember the first time I had to drive it and make a U-turn. Man, I thought I was going to pull my arm out of its socket to make that U-turn. Uh, over time, I got stronger <laughs> with it. But you know, it's just like that, the Holy Spirit. As we move out to try to lay ourselves down, to show sacrificial agape love. And that's the idea of laying yourself down, sacrifice giving up something, putting somebody before yourself. That's all expressions of it. Then the power assist of the Holy Spirit kicks in. But if you never make the effort, you never experience the Holy Spirit and the power assist that's sitting there idling and never being put to use. So it's not only possible, but it's eminently doable, and God will provide us to move us on that road to success. You know, I have learned a ministry concept called removing the straw. Removing the straw. Does that sound like that would be hard? You heard the expression, the American expression, the straw that broke the camel's back? You know how people get so loaded down that just one little thing, something as small as a straw, can cause a complete breakdown and overwhelm them? Well, you know, sometimes you just come along and you see people who are loaded down and you take little straws off of their load. Could be something as a warm embrace, a sincere smile, a how are you, and then really listening to the answer. And you may be very well taking the straw off the camel's back to prevent that breakdown. This past weekend, I mean, this past week, we visited a couple. Um, He has been a church leader for decades, and his wife is in the last stage of cancer. In fact, she went into hospice about the same time my sister went into hospice. And we brought some food over so he wouldn't have to cook. And when we went over, we thought we would leave the food, not bother them, let them save their energy. But we were so surprised to find that he wanted to engage us and keep us there. And he talked and talked and talked. We were amazed. We went home and we wondered about it. Yesterday I got a chance to talk to a mutual friend and he had visited the same guy, the same family on Friday. And you know what? He discovered the same same uh, relationship dynamic. The guy wanted and needed to talk. The real problem was what? The wife was dying. But he was also going through a process. We didn't know it. We weren't planning to address it. But because we were there along the way, that power kicked in. The power assist, they help us to do things we weren't even expecting to do. So at the end, he wrote back and he says, you know, you don't know how much your visit meant to my wife 
and me. You know? Because we're able to take a few straws off of his burden, he is better able to what? Take care of her. We can't solve our ultimate problem, but we can make the whole thing that much more bearable, that much more encouraging, uh, that much more hopeful. You see? So it sounds like a lot to love like God, but it's a lot less than we think. In fact, it's a lot more possible, practical, and continual. I'll bet you when you leave this place this day, you might be reminded by God of some family member or some relative or somebody going through some special burden, somebody who might be just being neglected that you can do something simple for. And today with social media, it's so easy to do that. Anyway, we can love like God. And we talked about how. Now, it's up to us to find out if these are values we live or values we only believe in. There's a world of difference. But I can tell you, I felt so much extra happiness this week on those little times when I did some little thing. Wednesday, going home on the freeway, this yellow pickup truck almost pulled into my lane. He realized it at the last minute, and he swore back into his lane. And he was sticking his arm out, saying, sorry, sorry, sorry. And I was going, go ahead, go ahead, go ahead. I was so proud of myself. <laughs> you know, normally you'd want to run them off the road, right? But you know, you feel like you inched forward. It's a good feeling. Let's pray. Father, thank you that you never call us to do anything that we can't do. Uh, you not only know that we can do it, but you will work to help us to not only succeed, but to reap the overflow, the benefits and the joy of the experience. And so Lord, help us not to let that power cease be idle in our lives. Help us instead to turn it on by ourselves, moving forward and finding little ways where we can reach out and bless someone. We can reach out and help someone we can reach out and make someone feel better about themselves or their lives. And so, Lord, thank you again that you are the good God and you did all these things on earth to show us how. So, Lord, we trust in you. Speak to us this weekend. Speak to us this week and help us to have a great week because we are loving just like you. We pray in Jesus' name. Amen.